Now let's talk about wings. So I talked earlier about um, Paleoptera versus Neoptera. They're kind of uh, general broad categories for different kinds of wings. And when we look at the, the wings of Paleopteran organisms, like dragonflies and mayflies, um, how we're going to distinguish them from Neopteran um, is going to be really the, the, the similarity in shape and structure between the fore wings and the hind, hind wings. So we have fore wings and we have hind wings here. And as you can see from this dragonfly, they're roughly the same size and shape. Um, they're not often all the same size, but they're the same material. They're both um, highly membranous with intricate veins extending um, around them. So these are the old wings, the Paleopteran wings. Contrast this with the new wings. And the, the Neopteran wings, um, for example, beetles um, are going to have their four wings modified into elytra, which are these, these heavy sclerotized protective coverings. And then they still have membranous wings underneath there, all um, packed in tightly under their four wings. Um, but the main difference is that uh, the Neopteran wings are going to be different from each other, the fore wings and the hind wings in most groups. So um, especially the structure of the fore wings is going to be heavily modified, either hard like the beetles, maybe leathery like um, grasshoppers, or maybe both wings are going to have um, little scales on, on them like um, butterflies and moths. Flight is one of the things that distinguishes insects from all other invertebrates um, and is something they're incredibly efficient at and good at and allows them to exploit a whole host of different resources and they're, they're really good at it. So this, this particular fly right here, this is a bot fly, it's one of the fastest flyers that we've seen. In fact, when, um, when Vector discovered one of these, he calculated that it was flying um, faster than the speed of sound from a mountaintop to another mountaintop. Now, Vector is a brilliant engineer, pretty good with um, Vector um, calculus, but uh, there's no way he's correct about this. Um, in fact, this, this fly can only fly about 30 miles um, an hour, which is still fast, but not quite anywhere near the speed of sound. And, um, but it's not even the fastest flyer. There's some dragonflies and some moths that can fly um, over 30 miles an hour. And that's just incredibly fast for an organism this small. So how do insects accomplish flight? Well, there are two, two different methods, generally speaking, and they're going to um, have direct versus indirect muscles, and then we need to talk about um, synchronous and asynchronous nervous control of those muscles. And so uh, when you look at the muscles inside the thorax of um, a insect, and I should mention that each of these different areas here has a different term. So um, this is going to be the tergum, and this is going to be the sternum. Um, so the dorsal, dorsal half is the, the tergum, and the ventral half is the sternum, and then either side are called pleura. And um, insects fly oftentimes by reshaping their thorax. And um, so you're going to have direct muscles and indirect muscles. <clears throat> so in indirect muscles, um, every organism, every, everybody's going to have indirect muscles to some extent. And the indirect muscles, in this case, when they contract, what is that going to do to the wings? It's going to push the wings up. And um, this is going to contrast with the, so indirect muscles contract and push the wings up. So in, um, in one type of flight, you're going to have two pairs of indirect muscles. And that's what we're going to talk about in section B here. But in, in one type, <clears throat> um, the type that dragonflies and grasshoppers use, they're going to have direct and indirect muscles. So the indirect muscles work by modifying the shape of the thorax and elevating the wings. The direct muscles are attached with a little tendon-like structure to the wing itself. And so when these contract, it's going to pull the wings down. And so uh, be able to kind of picture what happens when these wings, when these muscles contract. And this is a pattern we've seen many, many times before, right? Antagonistic muscle interactions um, where you have when one muscle contracts, contracts, the other one relaxes, and then vice versa. This is a pretty efficient way of, of moving muscles. And so we see this throughout all the animal kingdom. So the indirect muscles don't attach to the wings, the direct muscles do. 
indirect muscles contract and elevate the wings, direct muscles contract and lower the wings. Now this is how dragonflies and locusts fly, and uh, locusts like grasshoppers. Dragonflies are incredibly good flyers, um, but they don't fly, um, they don't beat their wings very rapidly. And so the, the nervous control for this type of flight here is called synchronous, because you have one nerve impulse that um, flexes a single muscle, and then you have another nerve impulse that needs to flex the, the direct muscles. So each time the mus muscle flexes, you need a synchronous nerve um, activation. So nerve impulse, muscle activation, nerve impulse, muscle activation. All right, so that's one kind. The, the next kind is allows for much usually faster flight and much higher wing beat frequencies. So these occur in mostly flies. And these are, um, uh, they don't have any direct muscles. All their muscles are indirect. And the way they, uh, they make their wings go up and down is just really interesting. And um, it, store, it ends up storing a lot of potential energy that can be used to um, and reused. And so, um, I'm, well, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. So let me start from the beginning. We have indirect muscles here that, that are gonna attach the, the turgum to the sternum. And when these contract, the same thing happens as we saw over here. Um, the the thor thorax is going to compress and that's going to elevate the wings. Now, instead of on the downbeat, instead of having the wings directly connected, you have longitudinal muscles that attach you know, anterior and posterior. And when these contract, the shape compresses um, anteriorly, posteriorly. And so what you end up having is the shape of the thorax um, is modified, either laterally or anterior, posteriorly, um, which with every type of muscle contraction. And what do you know about the um, the cuticle of an insect, it's flexible and strong and resilient. So every time you bend it, it wants to snap back into its place. So that's what I was talking about with uh, potential energy. Every time you bend the thorax, you're storing potential energy in the cuticle and the cuticle wants to rebound to where it originally was. But when it rebounds, it activates the opposite, the opposing muscles, the longitudinal muscles. And then when those contract, it um, compresses it anterior posteriorly, and then that, that stores potential energy in the opposite direction. Really what you need to know is that a single nerve impulse, so say you have um, a nerve impulse that activates the indirect flight muscles, when those compress, um, the potential energy in the cuticle makes it rebound, and uh, then the longitudinal muscles will contract automatically. And so you have this reverberation of longitudinal versus, well, you have, you have horizontal and vertical muscles that are going to activate um, back and forth from each other. So you have the compression of the thorax back and forth. And this, so um, ultimately what it means is you have a single nerve impulse leads to many muscle contractions as they reverberate back and forth. And this would be much, much easier to understand if you could see my hand motions, um, which you cannot at the moment. But uh, just know that the, the asynchronous nerves um, activate indirect flight muscles and they reverberate back and forth, storing potential energy in the cuticle itself. And this lets you fly really rapidly because you can, you can have a single nerve impulse that flexes the wings up and down many, many times. So there are some flies that can beat their wings um, over a thousand times a second which is just phenomenal. So that is essentially how insects fly. Uh, read the section in your book if that was um, confusing without my hand motions, um, but you can, you can get it figured out. All right, so insect physiology. Um, a lot of this is gonna be really similar to the other invertebrates that we've discussed with, um, so I'll mainly point out the differences. Um, the one difference is their heart is really their dorsal blood vessel. This is what um, pumps blood throughout their body and their, their blood, they don't really have blood. I shouldn't really say blood because um, the proper word is hemolymph and hemolymph is composed, it's this fluid that fills their body cavity. It's going to carry nutrients and hormones throughout the, the organism, but not oxygen, right? Because they have a tracheal system for delivering oxygen. So their heart doesn't actually pump oxygen, and that's an important thing to remember. 
Uh, they have a pretty complex brain, and then they have giant axons and uh, ganglia at, at the base of every leg. Um, we've seen this before, that's pretty similar. Their digestive system is where there are going to be some differences. So they have a mouth and then esophagus uh, or pharynx, and then they're going to have a crop for storing, and then they have a proventriculus, and then a ventriculus. And um, we've talked about this before, but what, what kinds of attributes of the digestive system are you going to need? You're going to need a place to store food, and we got that with the crop. What else do we need to do with the food? We need to mechanically break it up. And so the mandibles do that at the, at the front end, but the proventriculus is also going to do that um, during digestion. So the proventriculus has, it is a heavy muscularized organ that grinds up the food. And then the ventriculus, or the midgut, is where nutrient absorption occurs. And then the hindgut uh, is the colon, the rectum, and the anus. And one thing I want to point out, <clears throat> uh, you can separate these. Uh, you have foregut, midgut, and hindgut. The midgut, as I said earlier, is the ventriculus, and this is where nutrient absorption occurs. And that is because the foregut and the hindgut are all lined with cuticle. So uh, the one a phenomenal aspect of insects is that they can, um, they've exploited every habitat, they've colonized almost everywhere. But a lot of the habitats that they live in are really dry, and so desiccation is always a, um, a problem for insects. And if you have holes in your mouth and your anus, then that is a place where um, water loss can occur. And so the, the foregut and the hindgut are lined internally with sclerotized cuticle. So there's very little um, water loss occurring there, which means there's also very little nutrient absorption occurring there as well. So all the nutrients are absorbed in the midgut, the ventriculus. We've talked about malpigian tubules before. They're going to insert right at the beginning of the hindgut, and we'll talk about them again in a few minutes. And the last thing I want to point out is the gastric cica. So these um, are little kind of dead blind um, tubes that articulate at the beginning of the ventriculus. And these harbor symbiotic bacteria for primarily digesting cellulose. So if you're a grasshopper and you eat a lot of grass, which has a lot of cellulose, you're going to have very large gastric cica. If you're a predator that doesn't eat a lot of cellulose, then your gastric cica are going to be um, very small. So you should be able to infer the size of the gastric cica based on the, the eating strategy, the feeding strategy of insects. Breathing is going to occur, as you know, through the tracheal system. And the tracheal system, so I just mentioned that desiccation is a problem. And spiracles are openings in the sides of an insect's body, little spiracles here. And that's a potential problem, right, because you're going to be losing water through the spiracles. So there are three adaptations to avoid that, and also simultaneously these adaptations help avoid getting um, uh, dirt or debris or parasitoids or predators in your spiracles as well. So at the first off, you're going to have a protective lattice that can open and close, so the insects can close their spiracles completely, and then you also have a secondary valve as well, and then you have everything is lined with cuticle. So for, for a long time um, into, in through the, the tracheal system, they're going to be lined with cuticle. So again, you're preventing water, water loss and you're preventing any organisms or debris from getting inside your respiratory system. Eventually, as these branch off, they're going to get finer and finer until they end in tracheals. And tracheals are not lined with cuticle. And the tracheals are this fine network of uh, little tubes and they're going to articulate with individual cells. Sometimes even indenting the cell right at the place where the mitochondria is. So they're delivering oxygen directly to the mitochondria of the cell, which as you know, is the powerhouse. So um, really incredibly efficient mechanism for getting oxygen straight to where it needs to be. The last thing I want to point out is the um, tinidia here. So the uh, tinidia are these spiral uh, protein um, structures that spiral through the tracheal system and basically provide structural support to prevent it from collapsing um, in on itself when breathing occurs. If you're aquatic, you can't really use the tracheal system because water would get everywhere and you would drown. And so instead, aquatic um, insects like this mayfly larva are going to have gills um, on their abdomens or at the base of their legs. 
and some aquatic larvae are still going to have kind of a spherical system. They're not going to have gills. So these guys right here are mosquito larvae, and they have they still need to breathe air. So they have a little um, tube that goes from um, the ends of their body out and um, absorbs air directly from the air. They're not getting oxygen from the water. And so one way to get rid of mosquitoes <clears throat> is to get rid of any standing water. Um, so if you have tire swings or old pots, that's where the mosquitoes are breeding. And it's pretty easy to kill them if you just put a drop of soap in the water and break up the surface tension, all the mosquitoes will drown. So that's, that's a pretty effective method of eliminating mosquitoes is preventing standing water in your yard. Just a helpful fact. The theme here is osmoregulation is important. We want to um, keep our salts and we want to keep our water especially, but we want to, we have to get rid of metabolic waste and um, maybe extra um, excess ions sometimes. So the waste that insects are going to secrete is called uric acid. It's this highly crystallized form of ammonia. And um, so to get rid of that, you have this incredibly efficient Malpighian system. Um, Malpighian tubules um, kind of thread their way through the whole hemolymph, and their epithelial cells actively transport the ions into the tubule um, from the hemolymph. And so this is an active transport system. You're pumping um, ions in, and what follows is going to be the metabolic waste products and water. And so this is going to flow into the rectum, into the hindgut and into the rectum. In the rectum, you're going to have rectal glands, rectal pads that are going to um, reabsorb any salt and water that you need, um, sometimes actively again, and that's going to leave the metabolic wastes behind to be excreted. So it's an incredibly efficient system and allows insects to colonize um, even desert habitats. Um, although even in deserts, sometimes the, the water is so sparse that you're going to need some special adaptations to get water in the first place. And so some, <clears throat> some exoskeletons are actually modified to deliver water to the mouth of, their, um, of the animal. So this is the thorny devil, and it wakes up early, early in the morning when it's still cool and the dew is settling on hard surfaces and um, he will sit with his head down and his tail up and all these little spikes <clears throat> um, are for protection but they also, the, the dew condenses on them and then flows down in larger and larger um, droplets condensing into these little rivulets that flow directly into his um, grumpy little mouth at the end. So all he has to do is stand with his head down and water will condense on his body and water will flow into his mouth. So pretty, uh, pretty amazingly remarkable system of getting water. Insects are incredibly good at sensing their environment. We've talked about pheromones before, and here is all the different, well not all, but some different modifications to the antenna, primarily for detecting specific chemicals or pheromones. The, the more plumose, the more surface area an antenna has, you can infer that it's important for sensing um, usually a pheromone of either um, a, a prey or a host if you're a parasitoid or a mate if you're looking for that. So plumose antenna correlates with pheromone usage. Insects also have um, compound eyes which are incredibly sensitive to movement and usually three ocelli. So they have compound eyes and ocelli. And then they have sensilla which are these, these amazing little specialized cells. They're like little little caves with a with a little with full of nerve receptors. And again it would be helpful if you could see my, my hands. But what, what happens in these little pockets is any direction this little trigger um, this little trigger moves, it activates nerves all along the pocket of this um, cell and they send signals about which direction it's moving and um, how fast and how far. So some of these are mechanoreceptor, some are chemoreceptors, so if a, a, a chemical um, locks onto, a certain chemical locks onto this, then it'll activate the, the nerve impulse. So the sensilla are really um, prominent on legs and palps um, of um, organisms and the antenna, of course. You also have tympanic organs. So tympanic organs are, uh, so tympanum like a drum, these are hearing organs. And oftentimes they are found um, right above the base of the legs. 
and grasshoppers, that's where they're found. In this one, um, this is a fly that, look, that lays eggs in crickets. We talked about um, this a while ago. And this one ha can hear crickets from a long distance away and then kind of shoots eggs out toward the sound before it gets close enough to warn the, the cricket of its presence. And uh, so it has to have lar large hearing organs um, for its life. So you can kind of correlate the, um, the anatomy of the sense organs with the lifestyle. So be able to do that if I give you a brand new organism that has you know, a plumose antenna or highly developed tympanic organs or something like that to be able to infer something about its life um, style. Insects are primarily dioecious. I mentioned earlier that aphids kind of cycle through a sexual and asexual cycle throughout the year. Um, some insects are like that. Some can reproduce um, asexually um, or parthenogenetically, but the vast majority of insects are sexually reproducing. Here's a praying mantis doing um, its famous mating dance. And uh, first of all, you have to find your mate. And we talked, we talked about plumose antenna and pheromones. How do, if you're a female moth, how do you attract a male moth? You have to emit pheromones first. And so the female moths, here is a female moth with these special um, abdominal um, extensors that are filled with this oily, thick um, uh, gland, these, these pheromones. And so when she's ready to attract a mate, she will extend these out and the smell will waft through the air for miles. And a male moth can sense, you know, a part per trillion of this little chemical and will follow it up, um, upwind until he finds his mate. Pretty spectacular and very strange, right? You didn't, didn't know moths had this, did you? Uh, this is a fascinating looking creature. Look at its weird long face and in the back it's got some strange things going on. Um, this is a scorpion fly and the scorpion fly isn't dangerous at all. The, this is a male and these are little claspers to clasp onto the female during mating. Um, they are predators and we've talked about nuptial gifts before. What's the purpose of these? The purpose is to kind of um, uh, it's a gift, right? It's a, it's a little wedding gift. So the to um, it's usually given by predators to a female predator, and it's a way to avoid being eaten yourself during or before mating. So once the mate is found, uh, mating dances or nuptial gifts are a pretty common way of convincing the mate of um, to to actually mate with you. Sometimes um, this doesn't work out so well, like in dragonflies. So dragonflies uh, mating is, is really strange. Their abdomen uh, the, on the male, this is the male here and this is the female, the, the male's reproductive organs are actually right by its thorax. They're not at the end where you might expect. At the end you have these really, um, these pinching claspers. And when the male is ready to mate, he will find a female and grab her really strongly by the back of the head and fly around with her. You may have seen this happen before. And eventually the female will consent to mating and whenever she does, she will reach her abdomen up and mate with the, with the male up here. And there's a tremendous <clears throat> competition between males for females in dragonfly culture. And some female dragonflies, there's one species in particular that if the female mates and then doesn't want to mate again, then she'll actually pretend to be dead every time a male um, flies over. So if the female sees an unattractive male or someone that she doesn't want to mate with, she'll just fall to the ground as still as can be and pretend to be dead. So maybe a strategy for you to consider next time you're being pestered by an unwanted male. You can learn a lot from insects. And that's all for today. The captain has finally come around to um, Master Sergeant's perspective and my perspective about the, the death of, of Dr. Mastronomer. Um, so he's, he's convinced now, and actually the whole crew is convinced, that something nefarious happened. And the reason for this is that last night, Dr. Mastronomer's quarters were broken into. And they were searched, um, and uh, we, we looked for things that were potentially missing, and we saw three things that were missing. Um, one, there was a, um, an old uh, logbook from her time in medical school, and then there was also her navigation charts, and then all of her ice cream was missing as well. So 
three things missing. Her room was ransacked, searched very thoroughly, and um, trashed. And so someone aboard, or something, we don't know what kind of creature may be on this planet, um, so someone or something went through her room specifically looking for these navigational charts, this old um, log book with, with pictures from when she was in med school, and, um, and by med school I mean um, ast astronomy school. <laughs> And, uh, you know, just PhDs all go to the same school um, now. It's all just one big, one, one big program. Um, and all her ice cream. So this is clearly an intentional um, thing. And so the evidence we have from the proteins and her death and the, the, the toxin that we found in, in, her, in her blood, uh, coupled with this, has now convinced the whole crew that something is afoot. And so uh, the captain has tasked Master Sergeant with leading the investigation. And he is busy, as we speak, interviewing all the potential suspects. So um, I'll give you an update about what he discovers um, next time. Until then, um, be safe. Watch out for ice cream thieves in transmission.